Warning, this episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Guru's Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Chris Cromer. Chris is the owner of a minor tune-up, a brass repair shop located in Delaware. He is an expert in brass technology, a gear guru, a beer connoisseur, and a storehouse of 80s movie trivia. Chris is committed to not only keeping the equipment of pros in top playing condition, but also in educating college players in the art and science of horn maintenance. So pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. All right, and welcome to this episode of the Trumpet Guru Hang. I'm your host, Jose Johnson, and I'm here with the one and only Chris Cromer. What's up, Cromer? What's going on? Hey, you know, living the dream. So, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, doing this episode, and we are in the midst of the wonderful COVID-19 shutdowns. So Chris is coming to us live from his basement. So... Uh, basement workshop so so how, how's this all been affecting you Chris I mean how's uh how's life well, working out of home you know it's it's uh it's, it's it's different you know stressful um I shut down the shop probably two weeks ahead of everything being mandated um because it became clear that it was um you know, that, 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 you know, if this, this was highly transmissible, that I was probably the more likely person to bring this thing home because of uh, dealing with a lot of people, a lot of musicians who travel all right. over the place all the time. Um, and um, just the general public. I mean, no yeah. one else had that kind of exposure other than my other kid in daycare. Um, so I just decided it was the best thing to kind of try to curtail that and get ahead of it. And, uh, Plus, I figured, you know, if everybody was going to start uh, dialing back that I didn't anticipate people were going to be coming in as much anyway. Um, but it's definitely, uh, you know, it sucks to not have to, to, to not be in the shop working and getting things done and, and moving my projects forward. And obviously, you know, helping out the musicians who need their gear to be working so they can work. Yeah. which obviously no one is right now. Yeah, so that's kind of a catch-22. I did uh, come across <clears throat> some interesting research that uh, they say that there is a potential cure for COVID-19, and it's found uh, in horn cheese. So uh, uh -huh. actually, that if you use horn cheese as a salve, that, that it could actually prevent uh, COVID-19. You're saying I should have been saving all that. Hopefully I'm saying you probably should have been saving all that horn cheese. So uh, you could have cornered the market. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it's so funny to, to think about, um, you know, how quickly things can pivot, uh, in our, you know, our economy and the gig economy and things like that. And, um, yeah, as a, as, as a tech, uh, you know, like you were saying, you know, if, if, if it's people aren't working, it's, you know, they, they may or may not have the need for the, the repair stuff, but, um, you know, so what kind of projects you got going on now, since you're, you've got a little free time on your hands. Well, that's the thing. I mean, that's a, that's another catch 22 is that, I mean, I do have, I guess, different free time on my hands because I'm home instead of in the shop. So I'm not working on my daily um, things that come in the door. Um, but that time is occupied now by, you know, watching the kids most of the time. And when I'm not, it's uh, since I'd already income coming in, then the money's not there to work on my side projects. Um, as you, uh, as you, you know, um, I just, uh, purchased a, a new vehicle for the shop right. to do mobile repairs. So now I have a $30,000 paperweight in the driveway that is only just barely starting to kind of take shape. Um, matter of fact, the day, the day I emailed Denny Edelbrock about NTC and asking, you know, Hey, if I, if I decide not to go to this, you know, how's this work? Can I, roll over my thing for next year, such and such and such, kind of just dipping my toe in the water while I'm in the waiting room up in New Jersey at this shop that's putting in equipment into my van. Uh -huh. 
And he emails me back saying that things are canceled. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I guess that answers that question. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it had, had I known that a day earlier, I would have canceled my appointment with the shop and saved a few thousand dollars. Um, but it, you know, it's work that needs to be done either way, I guess. I, I guess the priority right now is that whatever money I can scratch together, I, I do have to still be putting it into that van. So yeah. when things open back up, I can hit the ground running because, yeah. you know, it's got to be, it's got to become functional. I can't just let it sit there. Yeah. Are you still doing any repair work or? Uh, I have a few stuff? things I brought home with me that were on my table at the time. Um, it's a little slow going, like I said, because it's hard to carve out time to get down here and do repair. Um, um, I just finished up a B6L for someone, but I'm, I'm waiting to try to find a time to go over to my shop and get my small ultrasonic tank so I can bring that here and do cleanings at home. Um, even though it's not ideal because we have a septic system, it's a little, you know, not something probably would be good for that long term. But um, it could help me knock out a few things yeah. here and could, there. So could you use it to bathe the kids too? Yeah, I should you know, get some of the things off them to grow. Or yeah. whatever. <laughs> they have horn cheese too. Oh, really? I'm sure they do. <laughs> um, so you know, for people that don't know uh, you, other than you know Chris, the the a minor tune-up guy, um, you you actually started out as a music ed uh, guy, right? Yeah, when I was in college back in, uh, you know, in the previous millennia, <laughs> uh, I was studying to be a music teacher because I had a, you know, I like playing, um, performing when I was uh, in high school and things like that. And uh, I wanted, you know, I, was, I, got, I, got, I got involved in drum and bugle corps, so that kind of got me really pumped up about confet- competitive marching band. And so my, my thought was that I wanted to be a, a high school band director with a competitive marching band and jazz program, maybe, and stuff like that. And I, yeah. I really enjoyed teaching. Um, but um, as I started doing that part-time kind of teching with bands, I don't know, it was, you know, I still love doing that, but it was starting to kind of become clear to me that maybe this isn't something I want to do full time because I'm a bit of a control freak. And if I don't have an ideal environment, I feel like I'd start, you know, kind of pulling my hair out kind of thing, you know? So I, you, know, you start coming up with band parent conflicts and students who don't want to be there, you know, cause in drum corps, you know, everyone's paying to be there. Clearly yeah, exactly. everyone wants to be there. That's yeah. not an issue. So yeah. you get a kid who doesn't even want to hold his horn up. It's like, well, where do you start? How do I teach you to do anything if you don't even want to hold your horn up? Exactly. No. And then being, you know, running into funding issues like, you know, hey, we you know, have 40 year old instruments. They really need to be replaced and kind of being put on the back burner um, for other programs at the school. Realizing that's just a reality, but it was just a thing that was like, it was just kind of starting to kind of like paint a picture for me of like, this is how this is going to be you know, long term, I'm going to have to put up with things like this and not actually put up a deal with them. And it was right. just something that was going to, I knew was going to take away from my enjoyment of, of teaching. And it just so happened to be that I started getting into the repair thing kind of in a, in a weird way. And as that started to kind of take shape and my interest grew and my, uh, you know, the pieces fell into place, it was kind of that a good timing of um, deciding to put that aside and and just go into the shop full time uh, yeah. not full time necessarily at the time but you know like kind of change directions yeah yeah yeah, yeah so i mean like who were like your big yeah when you think about every music every trumpet player has got their inspirations you know the the guys that that they looked up to and that they you know maybe studied with learned from who were your big inspirations on the tech side of things i mean i would say early on it was just based on I mean, as, as I'm sure you'll agree in, in this business, on the tech side, even playing side, I think there's a lot of camaraderie. I think there's a lot of, I mean, everyone wants to do well, you know, on the comedian side and the comic side, even though this close groups will encourage each other, there's a lot of resentment when people get TV deals and development yeah. deals and right. things. There's a lot of, you know, animosity that, that I don't find that as much with trumpet players. I find that, you know, we, or the brass world in general tends to be, a little bit more like we help each other out, you know, 
you know, just like you might pass a gig to someone that, that, you know, Hey, I know this guy could use this and I'm, I'm busy with this instead of going, you know, I'm not going to help him out, give him any boost just like that. I mean, there's plenty of other technicians or manufacturers that, that have done me favors and helped me out, whether it be, uh, you know, giving me a break on a dealership, um, like Terry did early on, you know, kind of helping me become a Warburton dealer, um, even though I didn't have any capital to invest up front. I mean, you know, um, and then just getting, being able to get parts from people and advice. People are very open about telling you things for the most part and sharing their information because they're excited about it and they kind of foresee the next generation coming too. So they kind of uh, are only more than happy to kind of share the wisdom, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, that's- uh, with, with that said, I guess, I guess early on people specifically, I would say at the dawn of the internet when I started getting into this, because I opened my shop in 2001. Okay. Offic- officially. So I was starting to do things and say in the late nineties, just picking at things and starting to research things. And I came across, across the Shilke loyalist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he did a really fine job of cataloging Reynolds Shilke's uh, research and a lot of his thoughts and just did, you know, different things about how he developed his instruments. And I, I kind of, I really enjoyed that. I would say as far as a I really I thought, enjoyed I that, I would say as far as of my, my beliefs, I think how I, I kind of look at things of my, my beliefs and how I, I kind um, of look at things the way you know, he did. Of course, did. and then you're looking um, at a, uh, Technician you know, wise, of course, Bob and you're looking at uh, technician yeah. wise, I guess Bob Malone continue, yeah. continue to be pretty key. I talked to it and pretty key continue to be pretty key. You know, I talked to it, you know, willing Dwayne to a good bit. Of, uh, he's ch- always, ch- you know, about something you know, willing to kind of uh, ch- ch- chat you know, about something or give me some advice um, or. So, you know, you know the, things the, like the, that. Those um, names off the top of my head. So, you know, the, the, that, those, those Blackburn, I've talked to him a fair bit over the years. You're just going to the ITGs and going to the tables and you know, kind of being at that point, the kid with the hat in hand, you know, kind of just yeah. like, Hey, you know, I'd like to know some things, you know, some things. Can you tell me some things? You know, yeah. So. Well, I mean, you know, and that's uh, that I think you, when you were alluding to the, the nature of the trumpet community, I think it's one of the things that has really uh, made me love doing this. And what's actually inspired this podcast is, that when you're at these events, there's just, you know, it's the hang, you know, there's, there's so many people there and we just all love the same thing and just sit us down in a room and we can talk for hours on all sorts of, of topics. Mm-hmm. And we do want to see the other person uh, be successful because, mm-hmm. you know, it's that, that whole idea that the, the raising tide raises all boats sort of thing. Yeah. You know, the, the, better trumpet the trumpet world gets whether it be the players or the manufacturers or the techs whatever uh the better it is for one of us the better it is for all of us so i think yeah and generally speaking there's a lot of you know there's no shortage of work that goes around most most of the time because we're all pretty small shops Mm -hmm. so no one's out there looking to take over the world so to speak um and regionally we're all spread out so i guess that helps i guess you know i'd say the next closest person to me who's a a notable technician would probably be Josh. Yeah. And that's two hours away, you know, with windy, you're back and no traffic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which other than right now, that's not a possibility, you know, getting up into New York. And I mean, even in New York, you do have you know, like a Wayne shop is in New York, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, he, he, he operates on a little different uh, level. I, I think for the most part, he just deals with Yamaha artists. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he works on other things maybe, but it's more, you have to be tied to Yamaha in some way, shape or right. form to get an appointment with him. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, and that was one of the things that really struck me. I remember when I first met you. Um, so like seeing you and, and Landris and Del Quadro, uh, you know, just seeing the three of you hang out and, you know, shoot the shit basically as uh, as fellow tech people and in other environments I've been in um, that would never happen. You know, everybody's too busy looking out for their own interest. And yeah. Yeah. I, I did actually, I learned that in, in uh, my martial arts school business when I was running that, uh, I was at a conference and, and they were saying, you know, don't look at the other school owners as your competition because, you know, even if there are 10, sc- 10 schools in your city, there's still more people in your city that all 10 of you could handle if everybody came in, you know, right. so, you know, as a repair person, as a tech person, uh, there are definitely more 
potential customers than you alone could handle. So yeah, for you know, sure. sharing the love, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm to that point now where I, I'm, I'm doing about as much work as I can do by myself. And, uh, as you know, anybody who's dealt with the shop knows, I mean, you've met Dan and Vince and, you know, possibly a few other folks that have worked with me like Brooke, um, and people over the years, um, that have helped me at a lot of shows and helped me with a lot of peak season work, like, you know, school repairs and, um, things like that. But it's, 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 I'm having a hard time trying to, to take that next step fully from having people work as contractors seasonally to trying to get someone in here full time to help uh, with things. Um, Cause it's, you know, you got to spend money to make money and, and it's, it's hard to budget the amount of money it would take to bring someone in, in a full-time capacity to where they can, you know, have a career. Yeah. If you can't even pay yourself half the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think that's where the need to go back to the old world's craftsmanship comes in, you know, the, the indentured servant. So you'll get everybody yeah. to a contract to just basically work for you and take care of you and, you know, clean your stalls out. And Yeah. And that's worked pretty well, you know. Uh, and, you know, everybody I've worked with has tended to be, pretty agreeable and pretty eager to learn and pretty cool with, with that setup with, you know, kind of getting a little bit of, of scratch here and there and getting some experience. Um, you know, someone like, um, you know, like, uh, like Brooke, for example, I don't know if you've met her before. She's a horn, um, major at IUP and, um, you know, education performance, not necessarily looking to be a technician for a living, but, realizes it's a valuable school skill to have as an educator to be able to kind of tend to your flock um, with easy stuff and and have that knowledge base. So she's, you know, she has that interest to come in and learn those things in exchange for, you know, a little bit of, you know, whatever that can afford to give her for the time. Um, And then you get somebody like Dan, who's, uh, you know, he's involved with radio Mm -hmm. And things like that, but he he likes doing this on the side. Enjoys the travel, enjoys the uh, you know the hangs. Yeah. So, but it's it's hard to find that person who wants to do it full time and is, you know, I guess hungry enough to take it on the chin for a little while while you get them up to speed and 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 uh, kind of groom them to where they're, you know, pulling their weight. Yeah. It, yeah. It's just it's a, it's a balance. Yeah. Well, like most things. So let me ask you this. What is the most bizarre repair that you've ever had to do? Uh, bizarre repair. Well, I guess it depends on how you in, it's repair, not custom job, right? Not custom job. Okay. Cause I had some weird ones of those. Um, that might be connected to Dan also. <laughs> okay. Uh, when he was, uh, he, he started, I inherited him from a, a, a defunct roommate who pretty much left in the middle of the night without any notice and uh, left all these students too coming knocking and going, Hey, I have a lesson today with so-and-so and me going, well, he's not here anymore. And Dan was one of those students um, who was in, I want to say junior high at the time. And I started teaching him trumpet lessons. He eventually became a music ed major too at Delaware. And I think he ended up going into music business and then interned with me. He did the first official accredited internship with me. And then, um, but when he was a student, he brought in a sousaphone and said, uh, yeah, this has a two liter bottle or a, a one liter, like a Pepsi Big Slam bottle stuck in it. Okay. And I said, which one of your idiot friends did that? And he pointed to himself. <laughs> But yeah, I guess it was just weird and just that it was just, you know, I was very close to unsoldering the branches to get it apart. Right. Because it was in there and it was full. It was really wedged in there really well. Nice. And we, I, we were, I finally figured out a way to fish it out of there. Uh, I don't know. I'm off the top, top, top of my head, I guess, bizarre repair like that. Other than just the whole typical student repair of like, I opened the case to wheel the valves and I found it this way. Yeah. And it looked like it got tossed down a flight of steps with alligators at the bottom. <laughs> you know. No, no cars running over horns or any of that? No, sort of nothing like that. I mean, TSA stuff, you know, all the typical stuff you would see just, you know accidents you know oh i did i forgot to i forgot to zip my case up and put it over my shoulder yeah 
I had two of those. that one before. <laughs> yeah, I had two guys from the same studio who were friends who did that, I think, a week apart from each other. And I think the same horns hit the floor. They had, like, <laughs> you know, the P54 and E3L and a C trumpet and a B flat. All, all needed a good amount of dent work and valve valve work. Um, but, yeah, nothing nothing too crazy that I can think of. Well, how, how about you, you mentioned uh... – custom work i mean do you, do you have any great custom work stories i'd say the weirdest one was one that didn't end up happening but one that i took a, a great deal of time to sketch out it was really early on but um lee walkowitz and chuck levin reached out to me and said hey we have a customer in boston who wants to buy um i think it's their ybb 846 the, the yama york they're their forty thousand dollar top end tuba that they make, mm -hmm. and this guy wasn't a professional player. He was, I think, a lawyer. He said, and he said he wanted to buy one, but he didn't. Ha he was missing his right arm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he basically the condition of sale was that he wanted them to find a way for him to use it with his left arm. And so he basically was like, look, we called Yamaha. They have no interest in this. They're basically like, yeah, no, we're not interested in ripping this horn apart, and modifying it for this guy. And it's just not cost effective and this, that, and the other. So he asked me and I figured it out. I, I think, um, like I said, I had it all drawn up and sketched out and everything, but the guy ended up backing out of the sale altogether. But, um, it was, it was weird because it, it's a piston, it's a four piston, one rotor, thumb rotor instrument and mm -hmm. what i figured out is that if i get a set of rotor paddles off of a minel schmidt that i could retrofit um some some connection points to kind of temporarily kind of clamp onto parts of the horn and then make some connecting linkages to basically make push rods to connect to the stems to actuate the pistons like rotors that way and then have it on the other side so right 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 function <clears throat> and that way also they could be removable so the horn wouldn't be permanently altered. Um, and then I'm also introducing less foreign alterations to the horn that would negatively change how a $40,000 tuba would play possibly. So uh, that's probably a good thing. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm kind of glad I didn't get it. Although I quoted him $8,000 to do it. <laughs> and it would be a nice little paycheck. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of like a price of part of like, I don't want to do this partly. And then part of it was all obviously lots of time went into even me sketching up, figuring right. out how I could do it and reaching out to some friends that had machine shops that could make some parts for me and things like that. And then just the cost of the instrument and how I felt that might affect it. If it was a version that might be playable by both the left and right hand and what I think that might be worth. So, yeah. yeah. Hey, so, uh, when you when you're talking about like you know, this idea of you know people bringing you stuff with uh for doing custom work um and have have you ever like looked at something and, and said you know there's just no way i would even want to touch something like that that's just it's just so out there that it's it's not even feasible as far as like <clears throat> the idea of what they want to accomplish or like the instrument and how much it might be worth or the short. I'm thinking about like somebody, you know, like, Hey, can you, you know, can you put a, a, a nitrogen tank on this or, you know, just something completely just ridiculously stupid. Yeah. yeah I guess. I mean, hell if I had the time, you know, if, if, if I wasn't, you know, so immersed in repairs and all the legitimate stuff, I mean, if someone wanted to pay me, I would try almost anything, you know. Because <laughs> well, I've heard that about you, had, Chris. I guess the weirdest thing, that, that would go in line. If, I mean, I know you're kidding with the nitrogen tank, but I mean, you know, we've all seen the flamethrower right. trombone thing and stuff yeah. like that. And that and that still can be fun to screw with that stuff. But it's like, that gets expensive really, really quick. So let's just say somebody comes in that's flush with cash and just has, has more cents than, you know, dollars and cents and wanted to do something like that. If I had the time and I can just charge them hourly, you know, I might try that. It's kind of like, kind of like it's along the same lines that there's every once in a while, there's been like an old lady that comes in the shop who says has some kind of antique pewter plate or pot or something like that, that they, I don't know where to take this otherwise, but I have a dent in this family heirloom and, or this needs to be polished. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I don't want to do this. 
Yeah. But I don't have a way to price it either, even if I wanted to do it. So here's what I can do. I'll charge you hourly. Here's what it possibly might cost. And if you want to do it, great. And if you don't, that's cool too. And I, two people have agreed to that. And I, was a, one was a stamp brass plate with a big relief in it. So she wanted polished and everything. And I charged her, I think, I don't know, $400 to do that. Cause it was just you know straight hourly work. I'm like, however yeah. long it takes me, it takes me. Right. And then getting a dent out of a pewter pot that was a, an heirloom, I guess it was probably ran around the same amount of money. I had a guy pull up with a railroad bell. He pulled off a steam engine and wanted me to grind it down. It was a brass bell, probably two inches thick. <clears throat> and he's like, yeah, you know, can you polish this up for me? And I was like, dude, I don't even know how we're getting out of your truck for starters. <laughs> You know, yeah. I don't. You know, I don't even know if the flooring in my shop would hold it without it going through <laughs> the floor. You know, and I said, you know, um, I said at least a thousand dollars. Because I'm like, I am yeah. nowhere. I'm not remotely interested in doing that. Yeah. I said, all it's not hard to do. All you got to do is just go take an angle grinder to it in your garage and get all the paint off of it. And it's just a lot of elbow grease. There's nothing in here you can't do yourself. Right. There's no point in paying me to do it. And I'm not interested in doing it unless you're going to make it seriously worth my while. Yeah. So he went away. Uh, <laughs> and I love trains. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, uh, but just think of how much heady topper you could have bought with that. Yeah. If I only lived in Vermont. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, um, if you know you, when, when you think about like the the advancements that we made in technology, and like you're saying how when you open your studio or open your your uh, your shop, that this was the beginning of the internet. You know, we've seen all these technological advances over the the past twenty years. Um, what are some of the advancements that have occurred in the tech world that you know maybe have made your job a little bit easier? Hmm. Well, CNC was already around back then, so. I don't know, maybe something simple and dumb like cameras, fiber optics. Um, because I got a, um, one of the things that's pretty helpful with doing valve alignments and assessing damage in the casing. I bought a dental camera um, that just plugs into my laptop, a hundred bucks on Amazon. And, um, you know, you can get up in there pretty, pretty good. It's got a light on it. The, the resolution on it's pretty good. And, um, it was, you know, I, I imagine something like that for a dentist office, like a sp proprietary tool like that would cost thousands of dollars Yeah. before. Um, I mean, even that was something Wayne said he got at a dental surplus place where they were, I guess, medical surplus. But even then, I think for his, he paid 1500 bucks for it or something like that. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, technology becoming, I guess, uh, more advanced has made things like that cheaper. Man, yeah. more readily accessible to be able to put bore scopes inside of in instruments and kind of inspect things and so that that might be a good one yeah. you know software for tracking you know uh sales instead of doing an expensive uh merchant account for credit cards and having expensive accounting software you have things like square that make it really easy to kind of organize things and kind of get payments that cost very little money yeah or even doing my website you know I didn't yeah. know HTML. My first website, my roommate built it because he was a computer guy, and I couldn't tell you remotely what he was doing. Have had no idea, and I, yeah. I couldn't figure. I couldn't even figure out how to do my own website until Squarespace came out. Yeah, I just, I just it's not my skill set. I get very frustrated with technology very quickly. Yeah, you're not alone on that one. Trust the cracks me. in the screen in my phone will tell you that. <laughs> Oh, man. So, you know, when we talk about like the concept of the hang, um, a lot of the hang occurs, uh, you know, obviously, if we're, if we're at a, uh, a show, a convention or whatever, you know, there's there's the hang that occurs during the quiet moments when uh, there's not the the mass of humanity playing horns in our faces. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it occurs at the bar. And uh, as my cat goes crazy in the background. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that you and I have definitely uh, maintained a relationship with is uh, our connection with the love of beer. So, uh, Chris, what is your 
favorite, your go-to beer? If I, if go to that I can get or go to that if I could get anything I want. If you could get anything you want. A heady heady topper, hands down. And, and I still haven't had one. You know? Really? All of my friends who go up there and get heady topper never save me any. And you, you gotta make friends with Steve Shires. <laughs> <laughs> Although, although, yeah, I haven't, haven't had it. I haven't. We have had a bit of a beer club going for a little while, but I, yeah, we haven't exchanged anything in a while. But it's a, you know, he lives in Vermont, so it's very convenient. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Younger, probably even more, but that's seasonal, and I'm I'm kind of done standing in line for that one because it's just such a shit show going down to the bar that has it finding out last minute and standing in line like a soup kitchen waiting for like a six ounce glass for $15. And, but that's a good one too. It just, it just, I, I had it enough where I'm like, okay, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> too much aggravation. <laughs> that's like waiting for the new iPhone. Yeah. But uh, industrial arts brewery makes a really good one. That's actually available in PA now. Um, you can get it at Wegmans. If I ha if I if I if I wasn't so nervous to go in there, I might go grab some. Uh, but it's wrench. Yeah, I, I remember you say, uh, was it torque wrench? That's their. Well, their torque wrenches double. are double. I don't. You know what? I I like that one a lot. I I got that one through, one through some, um, you know, colleagues, um, some customers of mine, and but I think wrench is a little lighter for me. I, I like the ones that don't that aren't as heavy and just like really feel like oh, I got to sit down after I drank that, you know, wrench is a little lower ABV and it's a little, little brighter finish for me. And I, I think I, I, I tend to like that one a little bit more than torque so far, but they're both very good. Sip of sunshine. Of course you can't miss with that. And that's available in PA now. Yeah. Any, um, uh, any desire to start brewing your own? I used to. Um, if you've ever been in back in the ultrasonic room before I got the last, the bigger tank, um, Part of, part of the things that were up on the pegboard, in addition to tools for trumpets, were my hydrometer, my bottling wand, and other things that I used when I would bop, brew beer back there. Actually, I have, you can barely see it, but I have a, a brew kettle. Can you see that? Oh, nice. Nice, nice. Made out of a keg, and you can see the horn grip handle <laughs> that my uh. friend made. My friend uh, that taught, taught me any of the machining that I know, which is minimal, um, made that for me out of a keg I was using as an ottoman in college and put some feet on it and tap and I had a nice boil kettle that I could do about six gallons in. I probably made about eight beers. It's a lot of work, man. And it's, it's really hard to do by yourself. It's like, it's a full day, even if you're doing extract brewing, just the time it takes to get the work boiling and then all of that. Yeah, I, I would just rather drive to drive to the store and pick up. It's a six. fun, you know. I did a I did a really nice saison that I called yeast infection. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. nice. Well, there's a story to that. Other than I'm sure there is. Yeah, I, they gave me the wrong yeast. I, I went in, I went up to a um, home sweet home brew, I think in Philly near Helium, and uh, I just was like, "Give me a basic saison recipe." I, I think I'm going to try some adding some. I'm going to try my own crazy recipe, but just give me a basic saison recipe so I can use that as a base. And then all the ingredients sat in a box for a few months, and I just was like, "I'm never going to get around to this." And I just decided to brew what I had and make saison. And when I started boiling and everything, and I went to pitch the yeast, as they say, I looked at the pack and I was like, "This isn't a saison yeast." This is wrong. This is like the temperature profiles. Uh, I, do you do homebrew at all? Or? I do not know. Temperature is very critical. Certain yeast uh, will only be active and survive at certain temperatures. And I had no air conditioning in my shop. And that summer it was run, running 85 degrees inside. Um, so this, this, this was, a, uh, what was a mead yeast, which had a temperature maximum of 74 degrees. Oh, so, but the thing was, if you don't, you can't just bottle it up and wait and then go run to the store and get it because you'll right. get air and bacteria and that'll, that'll ruin the beer. Um, so you have to get it fermenting and, and get the yeast in there as quickly as possible. So I just had to go with it and just see what happened. So I threw it in there and it fermented like crazy really quickly for a week and then stopped. And normally it would ferment for weeks. Mm -hmm. So I was 
kind of left it be. Okay, it's, the activity's done. I racked it over to secondary fermentation. Didn't get a lot more activity. And then once all the activity stopped, I mean, that's when you can let it settle and clarify, move it over to a secondary, and then bottle it after that. Because you don't want to bottle it when the yeast is too active because then your bottles will explode because there's too much, you know, too much right. air, CO2 being released. You don't want mm -hmm. that. You want that to be done before you bottle it. So I bottled it and I think it was drinkable inside of a month, which normally you'd have to, after you bottle and carbonate and everything, you'd probably be looking at two months before you could drink the beer. And man, I tell you what, when I opened that up, it was pretty tasty. And I, what I kind of realized was that the yeast, it survived. It didn't ferment as long as it normally would, but it, because of the speed of the fermentation, it, re, it released different esters into the beer and gave it a different profile. So it was very, it was almost like cedar mm -hmm. a little bit to it. And I got a lot, a lot, everybody I gave a bottle to was like, man, this is really good. Like I came up with some new crazy shit, you know, like, <laughs> and I was like, it, this was a mistake. <laughs> it was a yeast I problem. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, many of the greatest innovations in mankind have been from somebody's mistake. Yeah. So I made that beer three times and it came, it's, it was repeatable. Oh, so, I, you know, that's a good yeah. deal then. So I, actually, you know, it's funny because I was going to ask you about this earlier when I saw your, uh, your little keg up there, your, your horn grip. That's one of your inventions, isn't it? Yeah. Me and a friend in college, actually, I had to give more credit to my friend, my, um, former classmate john wheeler who's uh plays in the navy band he's a trumpet player for them and i've known him for a billion years and when i uh, when i first started establishing my shop which essentially was a hang it was just basically a storage room in the back of the locker room at the music building at the school i went to the at university of delaware and we were just back there that was a place for me to work on stuff so i didn't burn my apartment down but he was interested in gear so he was, I think, a sixth or seventh year senior at that point and uh, ha had some spare time. And so basically he was kind of like my Norm Peterson. Right. He would hang out back there with me and we would just bullshit. And we hooked up a car stereo to a 12 volt converter. Nice. And we're working on stuff in between, but just sitting back there kind of like, you know, soaking in the knowledge, kind of reading the same stuff, learning stuff, experimenting with stuff, ripping things apart. But one of those things was, um, he said, hey, what do you think of this idea? And he kind of said, what if you put something here under your palm that would keep your hand off the horn? We both were from a drum corps background. Right. So that's the thing we're back in the, in the day. You would get smacked on the hand with a drumstick for not keeping your hand up. You know, that was an yeah. aesthetic. Yeah. You know, Vanguard especially, you get that. Yeah. And uh, he, he's like, hey, what do you think about that? And I was like, huh? that's a good idea. And we showed our trumpet professor and he's like, yeah, that's a good idea. Because that would be really, you know, promote hand posture and keep your, you know, all these things. And then we're, we, we kind of went to Home Depot and started kind of looking for things we could kind of make a prototype with. And it was just nothing conventionally available was something we could put on a horn that would function the way we wanted it to. And so it just after a couple failed attempts with some PVC and some like J hooks, we just threw all this crap in a box and it sat there with some drawings for probably better part of the decade wow. and then when my friend uh mike who's like i bought this lathe from he started getting into machining and he got a, he got a cnc mill set up we kind of uh i don't know how we ended up coming around to it basically i said hey what do you think about this with building this and because he had machining equipment we were more able to get a prototype made and so we started making it. He made all sorts of fixtures for it. We really got into it and made, I think we made about 50 horn grips in his uh, shop. And one of the first ones, actually, Wayne Bergeron got. He was one of the first people I showed it to at a show. And he really dug it and was like, man, I could use this in the pit and make it easier for page turns and mutes, mute work without kind of holding yeah. the horn funny to do it. And I mean, last I asked him about it, which has been a long time, I mean, he was using it actively so i don't i'd be curious to know if he's still using it or still has it but he has you know the pre-warburton version so but you know yeah. that was the thing when we got we, we 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 invented that and um and then realized we didn't have the capacity to to really make it on a large enough scale to sell it so that's when i kind of we started 
uh, meeting with injection molders and different companies that could maybe do that for us. And it was just, it, you know, even just to get our feet off the ground, it was going to be like $60,000 yeah. to, to make molds for injection molding and pay all the startup. And then I was talking to Terry about it. And, um, you know, of course he got, he has the Pete and the buzzard and a lot of other practice aids that he makes. And he thought it was a good idea. And so we came up with a licensing agreement and, you know, they've been making it ever since. So it didn't sell as hot as I hoped it would, um, but it's it's an expensive t tool to make because there's so many parts to it. Mm -hmm. So it's really, as far as we've thought up so far, not really a cheaper way to make it. Um, so you can't bring the price down. I think it retails now, I want to say at 60 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. Um, so, you know, if it was cheaper, we could obviously get into the hands of marching bands, you know, that I think that would be your biggest market is for marching band or drum corps that if you could convince a band director to buy a set. Yeah. That, but you know, we can't do that. So it's kind of just more of like a boutique item, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I never really thought about using it, uh, you know, as a stabilizer for, you know, being able to do page turns or, or mute changes. That's. Uh... Yeah. Cause you know, you're not, you're, you're holding the horn. You're not bringing the pinky hook around to here. Right. You're able to keep it out here. You can see, so you're not having to compromise your, because if your pinky's holding the hook so to support the horn, well, now your third valve is definitely a little wonky. So your dexterity for operating the third valve, probably all the valves is compromised to some degree. So if you can hold the hand out a little bit more, it gives you a little bit, it, you know, it's not perfect, you yeah. know, but, but it, it's definitely not better than holding the horn with the left horn, hand, but it, it definitely was a, uh, an advantage, a nice and uh, improvement for people. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. cool. The new thing to, uh, to think about with that. Yeah. So, you know, as, as a tech person, uh, you know, and a player, uh, I mean, you, you definitely understand the ins and outs of the horn and, and how things affect it. So you know, if you had to give advice to someone, uh, you know, what, what are a couple of the, the key things that you want to make sure that you're taking care of with your horn? I mean, obviously besides, you know, oiling your valves and, cleaning out the cheese every once in a while. Yeah, that, that's about 80% of it. <laughs> and it's funny that, you know, we, when I do a lot of these, you know, brass clinics, I call them where I basically take the show on the road and we go to a college and set up for the day just for that studio, not for a festival or a conference. And uh, part of that, I offer to talk to the students about usually end up talking about maintenance and things like that and rudimentary repair if they're music ed majors. But that's the thing. I mean, there's so you people so don't think about that as a critical element that it gets overlooked and just discounted. Even when you point out how important it is, it just it's just not something we think about. Um, but it's obviously it's the most important thing you can do. I mean, we, we all know players who obsess over bore size and, you know, refuse to play, you know, say a medium bore over a large bore when really, you know, it comes down to it for every manufacturer that's different. Right. Yeah, that's, right. A different set of, that's a different set of numbers. So even saying that kind of is like, yeah. You know, and, and even, you know, if you wanted to say between Bach, I mean, you're not talking, you know, a lot of difference, you know, it, it's, it's when you're measuring it. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, tens of thousands of an inch, you know, they add up and they can definitely matter. They matter in a lot of things, but it's just funny that a lot of times the same players who obsess about that, are the last ones to get their instrument cleaned on a regular basis. And I'm like, dude, you're changing the diameter and the shape of your tubing by leaps and bounds compared to what you are in selecting a, a, a larger or smaller bore, bore size. You know what I mean? You're, you're yeah. not, you're, 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 you're playing on a small bore. You just have yeah. no idea. <laughs> well, see that, and that's actually been part of my strategy. Uh, I, I have an extra large bore horn. And uh, the reason I do that is so that I don't have to clean it as often. I'll dial in the resistance, you know, yeah, with a couple, a good... couple years worth of cheese. And uh, then when it's, you, when you I, season it like a, like uh, exactly. a cast iron griddle. Exactly. That's what you do. I've actually had players say that. So I, I, I've got it to where I wanted it. I, I feel I've seasoned the lead pipe. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Let well, me you know how that works out as the zinc removes itself from the situation and leaves you with copper Swiss cheese, you know, but the thing is that the trumpets are very volatile. Brass in itself is just, it's, it's, it's zinc and copper and zinc is, is a weaker, the weaker of the two chemically. And it's always going to be the one that removes itself and leaches out. And 
causes the horn to become brittle or holes or all of those things. And even if you don't get a hole or a crack, you're still, you know, etching the surface with corrosion. You're getting barnacles. You're getting a lot of things that are changing how that horn plays. So the more you keep on top of that, the more the horn stays true to how you, how it was when you got it. Because then you run into the problem where a player, you know, it doesn't change overnight. So they play it for over the course of decades and it slowly changes and they don't do anything. And then things start, you know, misfiring. Like I had horn players come in that, you know, my rotors are seized. And I was like, when's the last time you changed it? Which I know the answer is going to be, you know, or, or, you know, the last time you cleaned it, it's going to be never or yeah. 20 years ago. And I, before, I could tell them that that's good. That's going to be your problem. I know that's your problem. Did you drop it down a flight of steps? No. Okay. That's probably the problem. And then they go, well, is it going to change out plays? And I'm like, yeah, it is a lot, you know, but what, is, but what are your options at that point to keep yeah. letting it go? I mean, at that point, you've probably got a nice layer of zinc oxide built up on the rotors, which is now effectively working itself as an abrasive paste as you work the rotors and grinding the surface tolerances down, you know? So mm -hmm. you're going to continue to make the tolerances worse. The valves are going to bind more. And you're going to trash – the horn's probably already trashed. So it's like, you know, you can clean it and address it and readjust it and just be honest with yourself. Or you can just not do anything and then it'll just disintegrate in your hands eventually. So, you know, it, it's, it's tough to have that conversation when someone gets to that point, but that's why I try to be as proactive as I can with telling people about all this inane nonsense with, you know, cleaning your horns and oiling it and greasing it. You know, it sounds like, you know, middle school stuff, but it's really, it's not something that's been impressed upon people enough early on. So can you yeah. hear me? Okay. The furnace just kicked on. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Um, the uh yeah the importance yeah, of that having... answers your question sorry oh yeah 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 absolutely answers the question um you know one of the things that uh i have started doing mostly as a result of knowing you is uh i carry in my case besides you know all my other my mutes and stands and stuff like that i always have a rawhide mallet in my case uh especially since you know i i use uh uh Walberton, uh gear and sometimes yeah. I have to, to switch the backboards and sometimes they get a little stuck. So I started carrying a, um, a rawhide mallet and, you know, I, I've had a couple of players look at me really funny about like, why do you have a rawhide mallet until they have a stuck mouthpiece or uh, yeah. something like, Be like that. In case you get lippy in the section, that's why. <laughs> exactly. I need, maybe I'll need to test your reflexes later. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, what are some other things that, oh, very, very nice. This is even to me, in my opinion, better than the rawhide. This is a Fariz, my friend Dave will laugh because he thinks it's funny that I talk in catalog numbers with this company's stuff, but they don't have names for anything really <laughs> most of the time. So this is the F11 mallet aptly named because it, that's the catalog number, but it's a uh, canvas impregnated or uh, epoxy impregnated canvas. So it's a little harder, gives you a little bit more energy transfer when you hit the thing, but it's still not metal. So you're not going to mar the brass unless you miss and hit the lead pipe of the valve casing. But um, I like this a little bit more for that. It gives me a little bit more, uh, a little bit more juice on the strike than rawhide. Excuse me, rawhide's a little softer. But well, definitely rawhide's, you know, the perfect thing that's more readily available. I mean, this is twenty-five bucks, and you need to order it from them, which they'll sell to anybody. Actually, you don't need mm -hmm. a resale license to buy from them, um, like most other suppliers. Yeah, cool. So. so anyway. So the F11 adds the B flat, in other words. What's that? I said the F11 adds the B flat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what else you could do? I mean, really, this is the best one. I don't know that you really, other than a lead pipe swab, maybe, you know? Um, it's basically a clarinet swab that cut down smaller. Bob Reeves sells those. It, they basically do all the work for you. They cut it down and just repackage them. And I think, I think they're like eight bucks or something like that. Basically, you can just pull it through the lead pipe, and if you're, if you're dragging the lead pipe once a week and keeping all the cheese out of the lead pipe, my opinion is that you're not giving it the chance to get through the rest of the horn. Yeah. You know, it starts at one end and goes to the other. So if you keep it out of the lead pipe, then you can kind of 
you know, help yourself out in between professional cleanings and, and keep the bore clean and keep it, keep the horn plane true. Cool. Instead, instead of adjusting to a, 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 a crap filled horn and then having to readjust as if you bought a brand new horn a day before an important gig because you got your horn cleaned. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. That variable resistance. I, yeah. I, I, this is something that, that uh, we're going to do. Uh, we do every episode and uh, I don't know if you are old enough to remember or did this during your, uh, your days in college of the uh, Nagel speed studies. Did you ever play out of that book? You know, it sounds familiar, but it's not something I studied out of. <clears throat> I started checking out <laughs> of my lessons <laughs> when I started the shop. And since my trumpet professor was starting to check out too and didn't care, <laughs> it, it kind of worked out because he didn't start, he didn't hassle me for not practicing my Conconi studies. He just would be like, yeah, we can talk about that today. I'm like, what's up with your Blackburn? Why does it slide like that? What's up with this? You know, what's, what's going on with this over here? And we would just talk about gear. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd say the, the farthest I got was uh, Mitchell, yeah. Mitchell book. Yeah. yeah. Well, I remember uh, uh, working out of this uh, speed studies book. It's, it's just basically a bunch of <clears throat> freaking awkward fingerings and things like that just to work on your dexterity. But I have a segment in the show called Speed Studies. And uh, it's basically a rapid fire round. So uh, it's going to be all over the place. So uh, we're going to get your brain jumping. So uh, okay. just as quick as you can, let's come up with some answers and stuff. Uh, who's the biggest influence in your life that is not a trumpet player? Uh, do they have to be alive? No, no. George Carlin. Oh, okay. They're a good one. Uh, favorite book? Favorite book, Shop Class as Soulcraft by Matthew Crawford. Okay. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Uh, cool World. Uh, that gets a good, good high vote, I think. Uh, and uh, how about this one? Uh, what is your favorite drink? I think we covered that. I think we covered that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can have a dinner party with any three living people. Who would it be? Mm, man, that's because obviously not just trumpet players, right? No, any three people. And I've met most of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to eat with any of them unless they're picking up the tab. Oh, man. They have to be alive. I'd say Bill Burr. Uh, Rob Halford, who is yeah. the lead singer of Judas Priest, for right. anybody who should know that. I mean, that's common knowledge, right? Um, I'm not being too quick, huh? Uh, and oh, what's this guy's name? Douglas Murray, I think. Yeah, that's, that, that's obscure. He's a, he's a writer. Yeah. That's okay. How about dead people? Dead people. Yeah. Well, they're dead. dead people. They're not going to be very chatty. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it would have to be George Carlin. Then would be up, up towards the top of that. Um, Reynolds Shilkey for mm -hmm. sure. And man, who are some dead people that I like? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with my mom. <laughs> okay that's good all right catch, catch her up on things <laughs> <laughs> lacquer plated or raw oh yeah plated or raw but but you know the thing is and that's a, and that's that's the thing i take from shilke because he he was very there's some interesting stories i've heard about his how, how much he expressed his opinion on his distaste for lacquer but it depends on the instrument because you know with low brass you know the frequencies are different the fundamentals lower, so the dampening of the of a lacquered finish. I don't think it interferes in the same way or is undesirable in the same way as it is with a higher pitched instrument like a trumpet. Like I would say, a lacquered piccolo would be bad <clears throat> or lacquered, you know. But then, you know, with the way Yamaha has done their finishes differently now, they they, you know, sometimes you know, they're, they're they're almost inert, you know, because obviously you know there's nothing holding back Wayne with his lacquered, you know, 8335 LA. But, you know, it, it, it's lacquer was not 
when it when it when it came into being put on horns was not put on there for an acoustical reason. No one looked at the brass instrument and said, you know what would help this if we sprayed it with a clear coat of paint. That would really help the vibration on this a lot, I think. You know, no one ever said that. It was because these things get tarnished and dull and we need to keep them shiny for the customers. Yeah. So that's where lacquer came from. So it's not a thing that was done for acoustical reasons. So I feel like it should it doesn't belong on an instrument. If you, if you can help it. But with that said, you know, obviously modern finishes and maybe using it as a tool to kind of dampen something positively could, you know, be, be, be a different result. And that's a long answer for a short question, but yeah. yeah. Uh, I, okay. That's good. Uh, favorite quote. Favorite quote. Oh man. <laughs> uh, uh, here's here's one. If I can get it right, just just something I'm thinking of recently. Uh, you 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 don't have the ability to think and reason without risking being offensive. That's a good one. All right, here's a, a very pertinent question: two twenty or two twenty one? Yeah. Hey, whatever it takes. Right, okay. Good. <laughs> All right. You could have only one superpower. What would it be? Uh, hindsight. No. <laughs> <laughs> hindsight as foresight. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Can you time travel? Is that a superpower? Sure, that's a superpower. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. That could, that would be useful. I could go get the sports almanac from Biff. <laughs> Yes, another wonderful 80s movie reference yeah. by Chris Cromer. <laughs> uh, I'm an almanac of worthless information. Uh, that's not Seinfeld all worthless. references, Lebowski references. You yeah. can't. It's just all in there. Yeah, well, yeah, it's got to stay somewhere. Um, so uh, I'll just end with a couple of uh, trumpet-related questions. Um, what aspect of uh, trumpet playing do you think is most overrated? Of playing, it's overrated. Yeah. Or let's, let's actually let's, let's think about it. Maybe think about it from terms of like uh, uh, equipment. You know, what what thing is are people just like freaking out about thinking it it's so important, but in reality, it's oh yeah, bore size, easily. You know, it's it's like everything. It's relevant, but in and of itself, as a solitary point of adjustment, it it's meaningless. It it's you know what bore what horn what manufacturer what else is the what's the horn made out of what kind of horn is it what is it for what key is it in you know what mouthpiece are you using what's the thickness of the material what you know what i mean there's so yeah. many things that go into how that horn plays whether it's a good horn a bad horn or what it's going to do for you that choosing it with the mindset of thinking about only and I'm not saying people only think about bore size, but it is something that comes up a lot that where, you know, someone sometimes won't even try an instrument that they might otherwise like because it's got the wrong stamped, you know, letter on the casing, yeah. you know, and, you know, maybe that served them well. Maybe they've already tried that one and I just don't know, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'm more like, Hey, you know, if you're, if you're looking to solve a problem and, and, get an instrument that's going to work for you. It's more to kind of just open your mind and play it and, and let the instrument choose you in a way. But then you also have the thing with, you know, especially I guess in your orchestra world, um, I guess more so when it was more Bach dominated, because I guess Yamaha is really starting to bleed into the orchestra sections now, the trumpet speaking wise. Mm -hmm. um, but it used to be, you know, you sit down in an orchestra and you didn't have a Bach C trumpet, you know, yeah. You can be asked to leave. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, that's I'd be asked too. to leave regardless. So it doesn't matter what horn yeah. I play. So, you know, that, 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 that's part of it to be fair that, that, that people are going to be a little more geared to say, well, if you don't sit down with a large four C, then, you know, you're going to get grief for it. So I guess you better just sit down and shut up and adjust to it. Yeah. Well, what do you think the most underrated thing about equipment would be? Yeah. Yeah. Cleaning. You know, it sounds like it sounds like a sales hawk, but it just 
keeping the horn in peak condition, you know, keeping, keeping an eye on things, being, being familiar with your equipment and basically what's going on with it. So you can kind of, you know, look for the spots, know when it's you know, having a corrosion issue or just, just keeping it in here regularly, you know, uh, so you can keep an eye on things and make sure that the horn is going to work for you the best, you know, the more, the more you talk to somebody like, you know, myself, I guess, the more you're going to be aware of like maybe how more, how more of an acidic player you are versus someone else who can get away without cleaning their horn for 20 years. And it's fine. Um, you know, it, you know, that's something that, you know, talking to the player, I'm going to make them hip to is that, you know, Hey, you're pretty acidic. You're eating these valve stems up pretty quickly. Like you should probably get your horn cleaned twice a year. And the thing is, it, it, it just there, there's no replacement for a professional cleaning because you can put it in a good warm bath. Let's say you don't even care about your lacquer and you put it in a nice hot bath with soap. It, like calcium deposits are not water soluble. You know, all those hard, hard things in there that are eating through and the, and the causing all the bore turbulence are not going to come off with soap and water in a, in a nylon bristle brush. You know, the things that are going to get those off are a solvent chemical or an ultrasonic cleaning machine or you know, something like that that's designed to pulverize or to, you know, to, to, to eat away at that stuff. So cleaning it on your own is definitely something you should do, but it shouldn't ever be thought that this is all you need to do and the horn will be honky dory. Yeah. You know, so that, cool. that's definitely an underrated thing and, and the right weight oils. A lot of times people want to change things out or tighten something up or loosen something or just do some other type of adjustment. And when I kind of started looking at the horn, I realized, well, if we use a heavier oil on this, it fixes the problem. And, and they're like, so I don't need, I'm like, no, you can spend a thousand dollars on that if you want. But if you just use a heavier oil, I think you'll be fine. You know, there's, you know a lot of times, sometimes you, 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 you do need major, like a valve rebuild or something like that. But I think people understanding the proper weight and chemical makeup of their, the stuff they put on their horns would would go a long longer way the people had a better understanding of that that's Mm -hmm. interesting uh final question uh what advice would you give the next generation of techs Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i always i always say this without sounding like a dick (laughs) well (laughs) there you go (laughs) oh you know there's no shortage of people that that want to learn and that, that, that think they want to learn, I guess, or that, um, the first thing I wanted to say, which isn't completely true, but maybe I'll just say it for funny, but to, to you know, sit down, shut up and listen, you know, like, yeah. like keep your, keep your, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Yeah, there you go. But, but, but yeah, but I can't say that because you obviously should be asking questions. You have to be asking questions. You have to be extremely c- curious and you have to be, um, you know, just, a, just that, that mind, you know, and usually talking to somebody, it's pretty quick. To, you realize quickly where people's mindsets are, and who's more to be more adept for things. Like there's a, there's a, a girl, um, college student who just this past Westchester trumpet festival came up to the table with a stuck valve cap. And I fixed it. No problem, right? F11 mallet, right? Yeah. Right there. And she just had this look of amazement on her, on her face. And I said, um, are you going to be, what are you going to, what are you looking to do? Are you a band director? Like, is that your music ed major? Because I was going to tell her, hey, you should buy one of these, you know? Right. And she says, I don't know. I have no idea what I want to do. I'm studying music ed. And we started having this conversation. And just right before everything kind of busted loose with the virus, she came by the shop and we hung out for a while. And just the way she spoke and asked questions, I mean, I could be wrong and maybe she goes a different direction, but she, you can just tell that, that she has that mind of, of asking the right questions, you know, to be curious enough, but to also listen to the answers and be genuinely interested in the answers. Um, instead of thinking maybe of being someone who's like, man, you know, I, I, I don't, it sounds weird to say, but overly concerned with the celebrity of this, you know, mm-hmm. cause you get to have a good reputation and you, and you get, I guess I, I get I respected by enough players, people like that. And they, they are very anxious, you know, as I say, get their horn, their name on a bell, 
and they 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 skip a lot of steps or rush through things and don't don't really take the time to really earn their stripes and kind of I don't know just take just slow down not be in such a hurry you know learn things and just be be a little more humble and a little bit more just uh open minded with things or just learning things instead of thinking about well what's my next thing that I can do to make some money what could, what's another product I can do or what what can I do to get into the market instead of going you know what I'm just going to sit here and learn as much as I can and be interested in doing nothing with this right now and just try to absorb things until things kind of fall in place and maybe that's a lazy business strategy but as I'm sure a lot of people will tell you that the the, the best craftsmen tend to be not the best business people uh it, it, you know there's there's rare exceptions yeah, you know, Peter, Peter Pickett's one of those people I think who's really great at both, yeah. which isn't to say anybody else does it for yeah. their business, because I'm certainly not my strong suit to do paperwork and figure out yeah. all that crap. But yeah, you know that 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 kind of answers that as far as just you know being that kind of person, being being just interested in learning and for the sake of itself, for the sake of having the knowledge and then kind of figuring out how you're going to use that knowledge and kind of how that works in instead of just being very like, Hey, I'm going to learn this and I want to do this with this. And I have this information. How can I capitalize this as quickly as possible? Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm oh, sure yeah. you've met both people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It does make sense. Yeah. All right. Well, Chris, thank you very much for spending some time with me today. And if uh, people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to catch you? Uh, I would say start with the the website, um, aminortuneup.com, or you can email me, Cromer, C-R-O-M-E-R, at aminortuneup.com. Um, I'm big on texting. It's easier for me to do that because I can keep a record of it. But I would say until we establish a relationship, um, you know, I don't, I don't want my cell phone number being out on the ethers. So Only in the bathroom. Yeah, plus all the emails come to my phone too, right? Yeah, no. exactly. Same thing. Same difference. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Chris. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and looking forward to the next time we can actually sit together enjoying a frosty beverage. Or Yeah, definitely. 12. When all this uh, smoke clears, we all got to get together and, and uh, make that happen. Yeah, for sure. All right. So thanks for tuning in to this episode. And as always, peace and slide grease. We're out. <laughs> See you, man. All right, man. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound, and I'll see you at the next hang.